welcome to uh, Seasonal Allergies, the Natural Approach. Today we're going to be talking about allergies, what they are, and some natural remedies to help treat them this season. R allergies are in rampant work working these days, so um, today's a great lecture and great time to start talking about ways to approach allergy season. I am Dr. Tara Farr. I'm a chiropractor at Brown Family Chiropractic. Um, Dr. Sally Brown is my mother. She's a chiropractor as well. And Dr. Rudy Byron is a medical doctor with an integrative practice in town. So um, let's start talking. Who suffers from allergies in here? Two? Three? Four? Okay, we got some. Um, so uh, what causes allergies? Why do we have them? Um, allergies are one of the most common health, chronic health conditions in the world. Um, and are estimated to affect over 25 million Americans. So a lot of people have allergies these days. Um, allergies are hay fever, eczema, hives, asthma, runny nose symptoms, stuff like that. Food allergies are prevalent these days as well. Um, and the allergic reaction begins in your immune system. And we've done lectures on immunity, so you can go back and watch our videos on that if you want to dive deeper into the immune system. But we're going to kind of talk a little bit, we're going to put our science brains on and I'm going to talk about the cells and the microbiology of how um, allergies present. So no one knows for sure why people become allergic to a relatively harmless substance, but when this harmless substance like dust, mold, or pollen are exposed, the immune system begins to react. And I had an awesome picture of your mast cells. Visualize a cell, so this is a cell, and there's little receptors on it, okay? And we're going to talk about the receptors, which are um, IgEs, which I'm going to talk about, and then there's little pockets, little pockets of histamine that are inside these cells that are released when, when we get exposed. So I just want you to visualize a cell with receptors and little pockets inside, okay? So allergens can be inhaled, ingested, or they can enter through the skin. Um, once they get inside, our body begins to re cells become activated from the IgE receptors. They say, good, bad, it's bad, okay, we need to do something about it. And the, the, these mast cells release a powerful cocktail of histamines, leuco leukotrienes, and prostaglandins, all big words, I know. Um, but these trigger a cascade of symptoms, which we know as allergies or the symptoms of allergies. So sneezing, runny nose, itchy eyes, hacking cough. Um, and what the histamine being released is it causes vasodilation or permeability of your vessels to deal with that allergen, okay? And that's why we get itchy and swollen and red, all right? Um, so allergic reactions may vary depending on the type of allergen and the amount of allergen and how our body immune system is that day and how it reacts to it. So generally, um, allergies are more common in kids, right? Yeah, lots of kids have allergies, um, but they may occur as in older people and as you age and progress. Um, children have a weaker immune system. They're still learning and developing in our world, so they're more sensitive to um, things they're exposed to. As we get older, we have stress, yeah, things Stress can trigger allergic react, more sensitivity to allergic reactions, smoke, perfume, environmental irritants, they all play a role in developing allergies and make and can make them flare up even after years of remission. I haven't had allergies for five years and this year it's bad, you know, so um, they can kind of even weave, weave around um, through your life and um, yeah, so even though you get it one year, you may not have it the next. So what do we do when we have allergy season? We get in the car, we run to the pharmacy, and we get an antihistamine, right? But what, like Zyrtec or Benadryl, but what do those really do? Um, the over-the-counter antihistamines block the binding of histamine in the mast cell so it doesn't get released. So you have that cell, you have that receptor, it says this is an allergen, these little pockets of histamine should be released, but what the uh, antihistamines do is they stop them from releasing that histamine inside the cell and then that stops that vascular permeability and reduces the symptoms of runny nose, itchy eyes. Um, and you know some medications like Benadryl can cross the blood-brain barrier which is why you get tired when you take Benadryl, right? 
because there's actually the IgE receptors in the brain that cause fatigue um, and tiredness when they get um, activated. So most side effects are mild, including uh, of these over-the-counter medications, such as headache, nausea, dizziness, drowsiness. Um, some more serious side effects can occur with these over-the-counters, such as increased heart rate, confusion, restlessness, weakness, and tremors. So we're going to talk about some alternative remedies besides these drugs that we're so used to these day and age that can kind of work with your body and work with your immune system to help adapt and get you through this flu season without... Um, using these um, over-the-counters. So Dr. Byron will be discussing some natural ways to approach um, allergy season and how to optimally make our bodies function and deal with the process when the allergens expose, are exposed to us. So he's going to take over. Hello again. I'm Dr. Byron, and I'm an integrated family medicine physician in town. Uh, at Byron Health and Healing Center. And I guess I, I should pass some. There we go. Thank you. A portion of my, of my talk uh, regarding allergies, uh, we're going to start with following up with Dr. Farr and what she mentioned regarding histamine. And we'll talk about histamine in a slightly different way. Uh, histamine, as we know, is, is critically important for the development of allergies. And let's ask ourselves once again, what is histamine? Histamine is essentially a messenger. And more specifically in medicine, it's actually a neurotransmitter. So many of us have heard of neurotransmitters or messengers, such as serotonin. And if our serotonin is low, we get what? Depressed. Uh, other neurotransmitters, dopamine, right? People who smoke dope actually get increased energy because they will boost their dopamine levels short term, right? Dopamine will give us power. Histamine is a neurotransmitter that is critically important in the body, primarily because it is a regulator of our hydration status. In other words, if we're dehydrated, histamine levels go up. If we're well hydrated, histamine levels will be relatively well maintained. Once again, it's extremely important because we're not necessarily taught that hydration status is a key feature in terms of the regulation of histamine. And hydration status, you're going to see from the rest of my talk, is, is, is massively important when it comes to histamine and ultimately the, and ultimately the evaluation and, and treatment of allergies. So where in the body does histamine work? Remember, it's a neural transmitter, among other things. So that means it's going to work where? In the brain, right? So it's going to work in the brain. And we often have talked about the connection between the brain and the gut. So by definition, brain and the gut are essentially the same. So histamine is going to work very closely in the gut as well. And essentially it works all throughout the entire body, as you'll see when we, as we progress during this discussion. When it comes to histamine in the brain, I'll give you, give you a, few, a few clues uh, about why that's important. Many people in our society have lots of anxiety, right? I'm giving this talk tonight and I may have had a little bit of anxiety before this uh, presentation. And anxiety is driven in the brain by histamine. Histamine drives anxiety. As a physician, if I don't want to pull out the prescription pad for a patient who presents to me who says, hey, Dr. Byron, I have underlying anxiety problems, uh, some fears and phobias, etc. And I don't want to write a prescription for a typical anti-anxiety medication, some of which are highly addictive. I will then strongly suggest an antihistamine, such as something called hydroxyzine as a prescription alternative to the classic anti-anxiety medications. So again, I, I share that to emphasize that histamine is vitally important for functions in the brain as well. And what about the gut? 
What about the gut? Is histamine important for the gut? Absolutely yes. Most of us are very familiar with histamine in the gut, although we haven't necessarily been taught that. What are, what are some of the medications that are commonly used for the gut that are antihistamines? Those are the medications specifically that are used for acid reflux. So many people will complain of conditions such as heartburn, for example. Uh, and and they'll, they'll take, many people will take uh, medications such as Zantac or Pepsi. Well, did you know that those are truly antihistamines? Why I remember? Because the brain and the gut are the same. So histamine is, is working on both organ systems. And what happens, as Dr. Farr mentioned a minute ago, a side effect of antihistamines is what? Drowsiness, right? So we know it's working at the level of the brain as well. Skin, that's obvious, right? People who have allergies start itching at times, etc. And who knew, who knew that histamine is a messenger to the body for pain, right? Histamine plays a, a critical role when we are in pain. It's a signal. For example, did you know that most pain medications are, in fact, what again? Antihistamines. They're antihistamines. And histamine, remember we said it's a, it's a water regulator messenger. So if we're walking around dehydrated, histamine levels go up. What would that then do for us in terms of allergies? It would predispose us to allergic type symptoms if we're dehydrated. So those of you who are veterans of our presentations already know how much water we need per day. Someone shout out how much water we need per day. I want to hear it. Half your body weight in fluid ounces. Half your body weight in fluid ounces. Plus, plus 20% if you work out. Or if you're active. Plus 20%, very good. And we're missing another key piece. So you get an A minus in the class, but you want an A plus. So what other piece are we missing? We're missing the amount of sea salt we need, correct? Right, because our bodies are 70% sea water. We're not fresh water beings, we are beings filled with seawater. Once again, as a friendly reminder, if you go to the emergency room and you get an IV, what's in that water? Saline, right? With saline is salt, so salt water. And hydration status. So we talked about acid reflux, right? And we use an antihistamine. Just as a, as a little bit off course here, but when we go to the stomach GI tract, in order to produce stomach acid, we need histamine. Histamine is a main driver for stomach acid production. And one of the key ingredient, ingredients, interestingly enough, to produce stomach acid is water. You have to have water to produce enough stomach acid to break down your food. Got it? Okay. On one end, if we look at histamine as a regulator of our water status, and we can imagine being on a seesaw. On one side of the seesaw, we have water, correct? On one side, and on the other side, we have something called methylation, or methylators. So on one side, we have water, and on the other side, our hydration status. On the other side, we have methylators. And it's the balance of the two that control how much histamine is released in the body as a messenger. Everybody understand that? So on this seesaw, hydration status. On the other side of the seesaw, methylators. What the heck are methylators? Methylators are a fancy medical term that, of course, are meant to confuse us. Right? <laughs> no, one, no one is really told what methylation or methylators are. Methylation is, or methylators are essentially B vitamins, okay? They're special B vitamins. And the role of methylation, that fancy term in the body, is utilized, means to utilize B vitamins ultimately to turn certain genes off in the body. Methylation means turning genes off. And the big ticket item there is regarding detoxification. So we're talking histamine 
methylation and detoxification. So it's our body's ability to get rid of toxins is based in part on the amount of B vitamins that offer their fancy medical term methyl groups to detoxify or to turn certain genes off, okay? Prime example way to remember that would be if you don't want a child who has, who, who would have spina bifida, okay? That's a bifid spine and the chiropractors here can talk more about that if they would like. Then we're told to take a prenatal vitamin or women of course are told to take a prenatal vitamin and that special in that vitamin is something called folate. But the real bioavailable, bioavailable or absorbable form of folate is called methylfolate, okay? And that's the form that actually functions as a methylator to turn a gene off that would otherwise produce a child that has, that would develop spina bifida, okay? Understand, understood, right? We talk about methylators because they're super important in terms of detoxification. A lot of women like getting vitamin B12 shots because they help give them energy, help them lose weight. And in fact, the activated form or the biologically available form of vitamin B12 is called methyl B12 or methylcobalamin. Okay, so again, how many B vitamins we have in the methylated form on one side of the seesaw versus how much water, fresh washers, how much seawater we have in our bodies will determine how much of a release of histamine is, is uh, produced in the body. It's, it's a very, the reason this topic was chosen at this time is that we've been seeing a substantially high number of patients who have allergy type symptoms. And unfortunately, it's been to the degree that it's been challenging to treat, right? You, it, these aren't patients who are coming in and saying, oh yeah, Dr. Byron, I have some sniffles during the spring, spring season. What do you recommend? And you give them some Zyrtec or you give them some Benadryl and off they go, great visit, right? That hasn't been the case lately. Lately it's been patients coming in who have already taken all kinds of antihistamines, they've, they've used all kinds of home remedies, etc., and nothing has worked, and they're still coming in with the sniffles, itching, etc., eczema, and the like. So, when we, when we talk about the role of antihistamines, the key question is, are we getting to the root cause of the problem, or are we treating the symptom? Everybody here knows the answer to that, right? We're treating the symptoms, and ultimately, the body will work its way around the antihistamines, because we all know that you can, you're going to take them for a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, and eventually, they're not going to work, because the root cause of the problem typically lies in the balance of hydration status and methylation status, how many good quality B vitamins are inside your body. There are some outlying factors as well, which we were chatting about briefly before uh, we started. And some of the outlying factors that we're at super high risk for in our environment and in our region is mold. Mold is a major trigger for allergies. And why is mold a major trigger for allergies? What special, what special is? Spores, right? So spores get in. They, spores, basically, what mold does, mold requires energy, right? So mold requires energy. What does mold like? It likes to eat what? Sugar, right? So that causes a concentration in our body, which requires water to suppress it. So essentially, we get dehydrated from excessive mold exposure. On our list here, I wrote something very important, and that is histamine essentially produces excessive amount of mucus. Histamine produces an excessive amount of mucus. Now, why does histamine produce a high amount of mucus? Why is that? What's the role? What is its purpose? The mucus is present because it is a fluid that is 
covering for dehydration. It's a liquid fluid that is there to assist our bodies to keep our bodies moist inside in the presence of dehydration. I'll give you an example. We know that asthma is a condition that is highly related to allergens, right? Asthma gets flared up if someone gets around dust mites or gets flared up in the spring and the fall during the typical allergy seasons. What happens in asthma? There are two processes. One is bronchoconstriction, so the, the, the lining or the, the tubes in the lungs constrict, that is, they get smaller, and inflammation, right? That inflammation is mucus. What is the mucus doing there? What's up with that? The mucus is covering for dehydrated lungs. So one of the old school treatments for allergies, as Dr. Farr alluded to that I would discuss, is using sea salt. What is, why would we use sea salt and water in the presence of an allergic reaction? Because water, I'm sorry, because salt is water seeking. I'm going to repeat that. Salt is water seeking. So salt will go out and search for water. We all know this if we've been to the movie theaters and we've munched on a whole bag or two of popcorn, right? You can't, you can't sit there by, without drinking up, you know, in, in my case, a bunch of water. I know you guys aren't drinking any sodas, but, you know, you have to drink. drink. You get thirsty when you have, you know, a salty type meal, correct? So, again, mucus is present to assist with seeking more water. In fact, in Milwaukee, this, this place is now closed. If they were open for a couple of years, and I referred a lot of patients to them, a, a location called Breathe Ready. And Breathe Ready is a, 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 a quote-unquote clinic-type place whereby you could go into a room and breathe in dry salt, dry sea salt. So they would infuse sea salt into the room specifically for people who had allergies and or asthma, bronchitis, etc. It works like a champ. And it was, that place was modeled after places similar to it in Eastern Europe. And it worked fabulously well. So that gives you clues into how you can address conditions such as allergies, asthma, etc. We, we, we should have a clue about that anyway, because all of us have had snotty noses, and that snot is dripped down into our mouth, and what does that mucus taste like? It's salty. Is it not salty? Right? It's salty. Oh, come on now. Yours tastes like flour, son. It's flour. <laughs> Not supposed to eat it, no, no, not supposed to eat it. So, essentially, water and sea salt are carries, carriers of energy, right? Water is a carrier of energy. It holds a charge. So when we drink water, we're getting energy. And histamine is a signal for lack of voltage. Low voltage, low energy. So how can we put energy back into our body to minimize and or prevent and or treat symptoms of allergies or high histamine? What we can do is boost our energy. We can do that a number of different ways. Food is one, right? So we would really push a highly alkaline type of diet in the midst of an allergic reaction and or high histamine levels. So alkaline diet, think alkaline batteries. No, you're not eating batteries, but you're eating food that is electrical. What, what could name some foods that have high alkalinity and or, highly, and or are highly electric? Name, name a couple. What was that, Katie? Lemons. Lemons, very good. Spinach. Spinach, yep. So essentially we're talking vegetables and fruits, right? Vegetables and fruits. What about that big Thanksgiving type meal? No, that's going to that's gonna sap the electricity. In fact, you'll see people who actually get allergic reactions after they have big, heavy meals because their histamine levels go up. 
there are foods that are that release a ton of histamine. What category of foods are super high on the list that release lots of histamine? And many people are intolerant to them. Those foods will be fermented foods. Fermented foods. So beer, for example. Uh, all the fermented foods that we talk about here that are good for us, some people do not tolerate them because they release lots of histamine. Histamine-releasing foods. Fermented foods are right at the top of the list, among others. So... Not, that doesn't mean, oh no, don't eat any fermented foods. It means you should be aware of that such that if someone has significant allergic symptoms, pay attention to the foods they're eating and do the homework regarding which foods those are. I can talk about that for an hour, but they asked me to make sure I watch my time. So I won't mention all the details. It's a fun, very fun subject. Uh, electric foods is important. We then would move on to supplementation. What can we do from a really basic supplement, supplementation perspective to help to suppress and or regulate histamine? And I'll talk about a couple things uh, very briefly. One is something that's been on the radar around the country quite a bit, and that's CBD oil, cannabidiol cannabidiol oil, better known as CBD. CBD oil plays a major role as a regulator of our immune system. So it affects both the brain, our nervous system, and our GI tract slash immune system. So it acts, what we, it acts as what we call an adaptogen. And that's a special term, which means that if the immune system needs to be regulated up, it will upregulate the immune system. If the immune system needs a chill pill, say, oh my gosh, we're over responding to this dust, over responding to this dandelion, dandelion, then the immune system will be suppressed. And it does it that way as a smart quote unquote herb. CBD does not have any, CBD oil does not have any THC, assuming it's coming from hemp. So, and hemp is available in all 50 states, relatively easy to obtain. Uh, there are many different manufacturers. I mention that simply because many of us are aware of a lot of home remedies, etc., but not a lot of people think about CBD, which is also readily available. That works like a champ. So that's a good, good option for many that you probably haven't heard of. Uh, other things, you said, we're talking about oils, so CBD oil, essential oils, many are familiar with those. Some of those are for, for allergies, you think of uh, lemon, lavender, peppermint, among many others that are very beneficial for allergies that can be diffused, etc. Um, one of my favorite go-tos for allergies is black cumin, black cumin oil. Uh, black cumin is fantastic for allergies. It acts very much like CBD, cannabidiol oil, in that it's an adaptogen regulator of our immune system. Uh, it, that can be used in the form of capsules, soft gels, diffused oils, etc. Um, I, I absolutely love that oil, and I, I was introduced to that by Crystal. Uh, a few years ago, and I've since used it as a go-to for those who have significant uh, allergy-type symptoms. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I won't talk about things from the medication perspective because that, that's probably yet another talk in and of itself. But, you know, there, there are some, uh, you know, many different medications that function to suppress histamine. Again, we talked about that very briefly, such that you go from over-the-counter meds to prescription strength medications and ultimately to allergy shots that work at the level of what Dr. Farr was talking about with the uh, immune system and suppressing things like what we call IgE and IgG, etc. But why continue to confuse you with that? Um, I, I think really the basics, the basics are such that, summary-wise, summary make sure you're well hydrated with water plus sea salt and again, how much sea salt do you need? I didn't specifically say that earlier. The amount of sea salt is half a teaspoon 
for every 80 ounces of water that you need. And as was mentioned earlier, the amount of water you need is half your body weight in ounces plus 20% assuming you're active, right? And everyone in this room is active. So if a person weighs 150 pounds, then that would be 75 ounces of water. Let's round it up, round it up to 80. So that person would need half a teaspoon of sea salt throughout the day. You know, cook with it, sprinkle your food with it, whatever you got to do to get that in. Um, what would you do for somebody who's actively having, let's say you're out enjoying life at a family event with fa family and friends and your child starts coughing and sneezing at the dinner table and you don't have any of these supplements, you don't have any black cumin seed oil, no CBD oil, and Walgreens, 24-hour 24 24-hour Walgreens is closed. <laughs> 24-hour Walgreens is closed. So, yeah, we like that. So, uh, what would you do? Uh, well, you can reach in your med in your medicine cabinet slash cupboard and pull out some sea salt, put about a quarter to uh, a third of a teaspoon of sea salt on the child's tongue, chug it down with some water. That has a very good chance of squashing an active allergic symptom slash response. So really cool take home stuff that you can do that's relatively easy, well worthy of trying and you're not gonna hurt the person. They just might, might not like you for a little while, but at least you have the ability to squash the symptoms on a dime, right? So I think that's probably enough for my talk here. The other last thing I'll mention is uh, in my office I use some homeopathics. Uh, one is called seasonal spring slash summer and another product that's very good that includes a bunch of uh, herbs and essences that works fairly well also. Uh, so thank you for your attention. It's been a lot of fun. This subject is not an easy subject to digest because most people are dehydrated. <laughs>
which is normal curve in the spine, and kids have that. You can see it, you can feel it, it's beautiful. You ever notice how good a child's posture is when they're sitting? They don't slouch. Good. The weight bearing of the head, anybody know how much your head weighs? Roughly an adult head is about 15 pounds. So when we have a nice curve in our neck, the weight bearing of the head falls on these brawny vertebrae that are designed to support it. But when we take our head forward, what happens to the weight bearing of the head? It's all the muscles are trying to support the weight bearing of the head. If I ask you guys, if I had a steel rod, and you think of that as your neck, with a 15-pound bowling ball stuck to the top of it, and I said, hold that rod out there like this. So there's the rod, and there's the bowling ball. You would be able to do that for a bit of time. If I said, tip it 15 degrees forward and hold it, you'd get really tired quickly because you're not um, carrying that weight appropriately. And that's what happens in the cervical spine. Let me hand those my spine sheets out. So when, when uh, that weight bearing of that head falls here, these tiny vertebrae, your first couple vertebrae, your atlas holds up the world, the atlas holds up your head, and the axis, um, they're not designed to support that weight bearing. So then you start to have issues with that. So what we're handing around right now is a sheet that shows you every nerve that leaves every vertebrae, and it shows you where it goes, and it shows you what could happen. So I first want you guys just to look up there at C1. That is your atlas, the first vertebrae. And if you look over that, it supplies blood to the head. That makes sense. It's close to the head. The pituitary gland, an important gland, it goes to the bones of the face, the brain, the inner ear, and also your sympathetic nervous system. So if we're bearing weight abnormally, and this guy is taxed out and he's not functioning and the brain is not able to communicate with him, what do we get? We get headaches. We get nervousness or anxiety, insomnia, lots of head colds. It'll elevate our blood pressure. It'll cause migraines. And if you keep reading, um, tiredness and dizziness. So sometimes we get the, that vertigo or that little lightheaded feeling. If you look down at your second cervical vertebrae, the first effect there of that is sinus trouble and allergies because that, that is going to go to your sinuses. The nerve that leaves that area goes to your sinuses. So when somebody comes in with allergies, I'm definitely going to look at the upper. I'm going to look at their posture, and I'm going to palpate or feel for good movement in these upper cervical vertebrae. And if it's not moving, I'm going to create movement in there so the brain can again communicate through the spine to those parts of your body. When I work on people that have allergies, instantly after we adjust that area, they sit up and they say, "Oh my gosh, I can breathe." It's instantaneous. Instantaneous. So that is one area we for sure look at. The other area I will look at, and this is um, effective for allergies or asthma, is look down to where you look at your first thoracic. So it'll say 1T, your first thoracic vertebrae. Now if you guys all palpate your necks, just go ahead and feel the back of your neck, and you'll find one vertebrae that sticks out the farthest as you come down. That is your seventh cervical vertebrae. That's the last vertebrae in your neck. So the one below that is your first thoracic vertebrae. So this right here sticking out the farthest is C7, and then the bigger vertebrae under it is what we call T1. People who have asthma especially always have restriction between C7 and T1. And I think part of that is asthmatics tend to take on a posture that helps them to breathe better. And look, you know people that have asthma, look at them, they will have rounded shoulders. They're always hooped over a little bit. These muscles are contracting, trying to force blood into the lungs. Um, so and it says shortness of breath is one of the consequences for T1 not being in good alignment. And then there's one final place that we will look. And we, uh, when Dr. Terror or I ever have a patient that comes into our office that is sick, that is stressed out, that has a lot of anxiety, or we know is burning the candle at both ends. We're always going to look at T9. And 
your, te your ninth um, thoracic vertebrae is a little bit below your shoulder blade, so about two vertebrae below your shoulder blade. That feeds the adrenal gland, and the adrenal is your fight or flight, and when we're stressed out, our adrenals are turned on, and blah, 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 blah. When we can get movement in T9, and get the brain communicating appropriately, it affects those adrenal glands that will even reduce um, mucus in mucous membranes. It has a beautiful effect for doing that. So that is a wonderful, wonderful way that is only gonna help and not gonna, not gonna hurt anything. We're not putting any chemicals into the body. Um, so in addition to um, getting rid of some of the symptoms, we're also boosting the, boosting the immune system. We're allowing the mu immune system to function better so it can take care of those. Um, adjusting, there are, have been studies that even show that um, adjustments can uh, facilitate uh, the regulation of histamine better and even cortisol. And we produce more cortisol when we're in high allergy symptoms, which is what compromises, which is what is affected with our adrenal glands, and that potentiates allergies. So an adjustment not only makes you feel better, it also helps you to function. It helps the body to function better and do what it needs to do. The other thing that you'll get if you come into our office for any kind of allergies is you're going to get other ideas of what you can do, just like if you see Dr. Byron. So we're going to tell you, load up on your omega-3s. Those are anti-inflammatory. Those can help. They'll improve resp respiratory symptoms by uh, minimizing inflammation. Water. We never, talk, we never have a class without talking about water. We've mm -hmm. talked about water. The wetter the membrane, the thinner the mucus, the easier you get it out of your body. So water is beautiful. Um, and then we did not mention this lecture that we have to mention at every lecture, right, right, right? What vitamin do we have to mention? What hormone vitamin do we have to mention at every lecture? D. Vitamin D. So allergy time, we want to make sure we're not D deficient. We want to make sure usually allergy time comes at the end of winter. We haven't seen that big bright sun, and if we have, we've seen it from inside our house where the heat is on. So if we're not supplementing well with vitamin D, by the end of the winter, we're deficient. And that makes us more susceptible to anything that's out there, including our ability to, to fight um, allergies. We have a couple of products in our office that are really good for seasonal allergies, and I have them out here, and there's some information on them. The first one is called Natural D-Hist histamine, dehist, um, and we have one for kids too. These are beautiful products and what's in those, there are several anti-inflammatories because again you want to minimize the inflammation in the mucous membranes. It's got bromelain and quercetin, it's got stinging nettles, those things all help uh, with um, inflammation and, and clearing up nasal passages. And then there's also something called N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is an amino acid but it's beautiful for uh, thinning out mucous membranes and calming the immune system and improving respiratory health. And uh, that's, that particular supplement, we've gotten people off of a lot of um, need for chronic medications. Uh, you do a loading dose, you get it in your body within a week, and then it's one to two capsules a day for the whole season. And people do very well on that. So um, there are lots of other things and other ideas for allergies um, aside from going to a chemical. And because we're always, we're so inundated with chemicals in this country, the least uh, we need to be dependent on them, the easier, easier we have for that. So uh, I'm just going to give you one other tip then so that we don't fall into these bad posture patterns. So when you're driving your car, how should your seat, how, where should your seat back be when you're in your car? Because I see people driving like this, or like this. <laughs> and what I tell my patients is that headrest is there for a reason. If your seat back is back and your body is here, if you do get rear-ended, look how far back your head has to go until it hits that. That's whiplash. If you bring that seat back upright and find that nice little space where when you're sitting in your car, the back of your head touches the headrest and it feels comfortable. The second you touch that headrest, your shoulders drop down. When you're not supporting your head, you're going to be forward. But when you're touching that, everything relaxes. So driving, we do every day. Let's drive correctly so we're not messing our 
our uh, necks and our backs up. Same thing with the computer. You just have to look at where your head is in space. When you're on your computer, if you're real focused, just stop and draw a line from your earlobe. If it comes over your chest, you need to pull that head back. And you will feel instantly that relief in your shoulders when you do that because now your joints are supporting your head instead of the muscles in the front of your neck trying to do that. So chiropractic care can help with many, 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 many things, and allergies is definitely one of them. Anybody have any questions for any of us? Yep. Um, what is the uh, requirement for a vitamin D for children? I like 2,000.